Good morning, everybody. This is uh, Mike Abood with uh, Tetherview. Uh, we're going to get started here. Um, thanks for joining our webinar um, regarding cybersecurity and compliance. I'm pleased to be joined by Shayar Shigagi from BDO and uh, Jamie Barnett from Venable. Um, before we get started, I'd just like to go through some of the, the disclaimers here regarding uh, the CLE. Uh, Tetherview is provider number 2017, and we're registered with the Supreme Court of New Jersey Board of Continuing Legal Education. After the webinar today, you will receive an email um, with all of the CLE information. The New Jersey Supreme Court CLE is recognized and reciprocated in many other states. If you need assistance registering in your state, for, well, with regards to reciprocity, please contact mo at tetherview.com. That's mo at tetherview.com. Well, great. Thank you and good morning. Um, what I'd like to do is just introduce myself, Michael Abood. I am the CEO and founder of Tetherview. We are a private cloud provider, and what we do is virtualize clients' environments, IT environment. Um, and we provide virtual desktops and server hosting for clients, where we eliminate on-site hardware um, and eliminate the dependency on any physical device. Um, what we strive to do is build that infrastructure foundation for our clients and allow them to focus on their business and their core competency. Um, we are proud to say that we only provide virtualization and private cloud services and that's what we specialize in. Um, we do not provide um, ERP, we do not provide consulting, and that's where we rely on our partners like BDO and Venable to come in and assist and provide that the rest of the, the, the environment that a client may need. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Jamie Barnett, um, retired Rear Admiral from the U.S. Navy. Jamie, would you like to introduce yourself and, and give a little background on, on what you're doing over there at Venable? Sure, thanks Mike. Yeah, so uh, I'm <clears throat> The, uh, the co-chair of our telecommunications group, and we work have a kind of a combined practice of cybersecurity, data breach, and privacy. I spent three years at the Federal Communications Commission as the chief of the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, uh, where I had charge of the cybersecurity portfolio. We created the cybersecurity division there and uh, initiated several policy um, moves uh, for the FCC. We practice here. What, what Venable does is, is, like Mike said, we work with... Uh, technology companies with cybersecurity consultants um, and, and part of that is because of the team that we have here we can help you on the legal and policy side uh, which has to to go as you'll hear today has to go through every part of your company or firm I mean it really has to be uh, enterprise-wide and uh, by, by doing it through uh, a firm uh, whether it's your firm or, or another legal firm such as ours uh, you can add uh, the, the additional protection of attorney-client privilege from some of the litigation and regulatory problems that we'll talk about as well. Thanks, Jamie. Um, I'd like to also introduce now uh, Shire Shigagi from, from BDO. Shire? Hi, everyone. Shire Shigagi. I'm uh, uh, responsible for uh, BDO's technology advisory as well as uh, international lead for cybersecurity. Um, video is the fifth largest uh, tax audit uh, accounting consulting firm in the world. Um, we offer obviously services in variety of uh, areas as it relates to technology advisory, but one of the areas that we are related to this uh, webinar is to cybersecurity. Um, we cover uh, and help clients in, in a number of areas from a strategic set of services. Uh, program design as it relates to uh, cybersecurity risk management program. Um, we, we go through a variety of assessments and testing based on a number of uh, uh, scenarios as well as industries that are uh, tied to particular regulations. Uh, we do security architecture and transformation type of work, um, incident response both on proactive and reactive side as well as uh, digital forensic and investigation working with some of the law firms um, and, and also cyber insurance and uh, both claims preparation as well as uh, coverage adequacy. So we have 
a number of areas that we are uh, very busy with in terms of the, the services and be happy to, uh, as we go through the presentation, discuss some of the details. Hey, great. Thanks, Shayar. Um, so again, throughout the presentation, um, we're going to be surveying the audience with some questions. It's required that you answer at least five of the questions um, to qualify for the CLE. So please uh, answer the questions. Uh, we're required in case we get audited to provide that data for you to qualify for the CLA, CLE. Um, so again, so today what we want to do is provide everyone with the foundation for understanding what cybersecurity is. And the key takeaways that we want today is for everyone to understand how to develop the types of policies, documents, or reports that need to be created to effectively manage a cybersecurity program and to respond to an incident. Essentially, we want to allow you to build a fit for purpose, the right size response to your cybersecurity requirements. We also want to provide you with the tools to assess your cybersecurity risk. And we'll get into that. And what that means is we want you to be able to do a self-assessment, determine when to bring in the professionals um, to, to provide that assessment for you, um, and determine what type of risks that you face. And make sure you understand those, because they're not just about regulatory risks. Um, it, it, there, there's, and we'll get into some details here. There's a lot of different risk involved with cybersecurity. Um, what's really important is when a breach happens. And, you know, we'll get into this as well, but everyone has been hacked. Um, you know, from the SEC chairman to the FBI director, everyone agrees that everyone has been hacked. It's not a function of if, it's a function of you acknowledging or identifying that you have been breached. Um, also, what's really important is when to take and when to seek that guidance from your trusted advisor. Whether it's your CPA, your, uh, your attorney, um, a third-party professional, um, or your managed service provider. It's really, really important to take guidance from them because they have visibility into cybersecurity beyond what you, you, you may understand. Um, and again, the, the key here, the key takeaway is to know how to develop the game plan from beginning to end. So what we like to do is just really get started with the self-assessment. And, and it's really important that you or your clients know, do you have a legitimate cybersecurity policy? And the, the, we're going to poll this question in a moment. Most folks do not have a real cybersecurity policy. Jamie and, and Shire, would you, would you like to elaborate on what you see um, as far as experience interacting with your clients and the types of cybersecurity policy that they have or if they have one? Sure. What we, we see sometimes is people have kind of bolted on to their privacy policy, um, something. But the, the fact of the matter is <clears throat> that unless uh, the company has and firm, whatever, has driven cybersecurity into every aspect uh, of, of uh, the enterprise, so that includes hiring policies, uh, the way that you deal with your suppliers, uh, and unless you have policies that are actually uh, written, understood, and, and one of the first things I generally ask people is, well, do you have a, an incident response plan? If you don't have an incident response plan, I would say you don't have an effective uh, cybersecurity policy, or really it should be a set of policies. Yes, yeah, so uh, when, we look, when we look at cybersecurity policy and, and in a way kind of taking a step back and looking at it from a you know, cyber risk management program and a strategy, uh, we really uh, see that today uh, a lot of clients, especially in the mid-market, are lacking um, uh, all of the, what we call the 360-degree view of what cybersecurity is all about. You know, the traditional thinking of, do I have antivirus programs on my laptop or desktop and or if our, my firewalls are patched properly is no longer valid as it relates to cybersecurity. We, we try to, uh, you know, work with our clients and um, we see that there's this huge gap in terms of their level of understanding of uh, if they're prepared to respond to a breach effectively. Um, as Jamie mentioned about having a, a, an effect, I think that's just a response plan um, or looking at variety of information security, the traditional information security layers of defense in alignment with uh, priorities that the organizations need to lay out 
but there are other components that really is as part of this self-assessment organizations need to think about uh, they need to understand the you know components that ties into digital forensics post uh, breach uh, to make sure that they have uh, you know a full understanding of what that means they have to understand data privacy and protection aspects of their business model uh, and requirements that are tied into various state level and or uh, country level uh, and it's evolving and then of course there is this whole cyber insurance that addresses uh, how much of your risk you're willing to transfer so uh, as you just heard, uh, cybersecurity is not just IT. It covers a lot of areas in forensics, privacy, insurance, and, and you know, companies, uh, I think they really need to take a step back and look at this from a holistic perspective. Yeah, exactly. I mean, one of the things that, that, that we at Tetherview see um, companies miss is the third-party risk. Um, and that's, that's key as part of a cybersecurity policy because breaches and some of the most famous breaches like the Target breach, the Sony breach, they don't happen directly. They happen through a third party um, and one of the easier ones to speak to is the Target breach. Target was breached because they allowed an HVAC vendor access to their environment and a hacker was easily able to get into the HVAC vendor and the HVAC vendor didn't think it was necessary for them to have the firewalls that maybe Target had but the HVAC vendor got the, the hacker got lucky. He was in the network for the HVAC vendor, and all of a sudden realized, hey, I've got a point-to-point -point connection to Target of all places, and Target from there he was able to navigate his way through. Now, was was the HVAC vendor completely to blame? No, but that was the initial point of the breach. So as part of an, assess, uh, an assessment and a cyber, good cybersecurity policy, not only do we have to incorporate all of the things that that Shayar and Jamie spoke to, but it's it's very important to understand what the macro picture is and what other risks there are. If I, um, if I could uh, jump in there for just please. a second, Mike. Uh, so I can't speak as to details about Target because uh, we were hired by Target uh, after the breach to help them. Uh, but I, I will just from press report, shall we say, I mean, that was 40 million credit and debit card accounts that were um, stolen, and the, the, the estimated cost to um, Target was about $252 million, and they settled a, a class action suit for millions of dollars, um, and that's all because uh, they didn't have the co contractual responsibility on a third-party vendor. Uh, to make sure that they had cybersecurity things as simple as firewalls and, and other protections like that. Exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'd like to continue the discussion, but as, as we're discussing this, I'm going to launch the first polling question or survey. Um, and the question is, does your organization have a cybersecurity policy? We're going to leave this up for a few, a few minutes here um, as we go on. Please, Shire, continue. I was just basically going to say that, uh, you know, we've seen the number of attacks uh, since 2005, if you go and look at some of the data, obviously the, the frequency of attacks have significantly increased. Um, and uh, we also see that uh, unlike, unlike the traditional incentives focusing primarily on financial gains, uh, we also see uh, you know, benefits or sorry, incentives of these types of attacks are all over the map. It could be religious fanatic groups attack, attacking a porn website, or it could be, uh, uh, you know, uh, bringing in down the infrastructure for some ransomware that is tied to some medical records of a hospital, especially the, 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 the critical units within the hospitals, and that's by the way one of the target attack, uh, target industries uh, under attack these days. Uh, so we, we, we see that, uh, you know, the attacks are not discriminating by industry. They're actually going all over the map. So I'd just like to, to speak to this so that everyone, you know, everyone's honest here. This is great. Um, and they understand that you're not alone. 66% of our participants said they do not have a cybersecurity plan. Um, and 33% said yes. I would, I would guess that the 33 that said yes probably want some form of improvement on that. Um, here we go. We're just going to continue here. Um, so 
again, you know, who should you rely on when you're building that self-assessment? Our approach is you need to get the input of your infrastructure solution provider. You need to make sure that your trusted advisors are on board. And, and as Jamie said and Shayar both said, it's about the entire organization. Um, we were joking before this, this call as we were prepping for it. Um, I've got a magnet stuck to the back of my door, and I'm sure some of you said this. It says, passwords are like underwear. Um, change them frequently and don't leave them lying around. Um, and it's <laughs> basic, 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 you know, staff education like that. Um, and, and, and letting them understand what the risks are that's going to reduce the total risk for your organization. Um, let's, let's continue here. Um, by by the way, on that point, on the, on the trusted advisors and stuff, I mean, <clears throat> you got to know where your data is, which uh, I know you, you understand, Mike, uh, but we always recommend our clients that they, even though they may have a tremendous internal uh, cybersecurity uh, team, it, it always helps to have a different set of eyes on that that may, may find something that was missed. And so having someone come in to take a look at that, I think is, at least periodically, I think it makes sense. So and, uh, yeah. and one of the things uh, we advise clients to do is, uh, you know, every business, uh, regardless of you know uh, your your con you know your uh, operating model, is different when it comes to uh, uh, cybersecurity risks. And uh, one of the first things that we advise clients to think about is really determine the uh, cybersecurity risk profile. And that's really done through examination of uh, you know what is your inherent risk that obviously have you you have no control over because of the characteristics of your company that that ties into your geography or you know centralized versus decentralized a number of other factors that has to be part of the inherent risk calculation and then ultimately what is your residual list risk based on your risk appetite as well as your uh, risk transfer capabilities such as cyber insurance and that really is tied into how you de determine your sort of cyber security strategy that ultimately drives your policy so we think that you know we really you really need to understand that to be able to apply the right level of mitigation uh, to be able to really uh, not prevent because as uh, Mike said there is no such a thing as prevent in this world when it comes to cyber attacks but you can reduce, minimize, and or contain the impact of those attacks. As you can tell, we, we, we tend to deviate from script here, but um, that's exactly right. Um, if anyone ever comes to you and says, we can make you impenetrable, you need to run in the other direction. Um, I have met with hackers, both white hat, black hat, um, everything in between, folks in the intelligence community, and just about everyone has been breached. Um, and, and it's really important to understand that. Um, you know, one of that, that the... includes the White House and uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, so... <laughs> yep, and, and, and Jamie, I understand you have some folks in, in your organization that have worked in both, uh, both of those facilities. Right. Um, so so it's, it's important for you to, to size up your risk and um, develop your response and your protection accordingly. Um, you know, one of the... Let me mention one other thing, because uh, I think uh, what, what you and Shire said leads into the next slide on, on understanding the risk. But <clears throat> most of the time we hear about this and we think about this, oh, we've had a breach. Uh, but the, the fact of the matter is that a lot of the damage and the risk occurs before you know. Um, the cyber firm Mandiant uh, had, had done a, uh, a study where they showed that only about 31% of <clears throat> compromises were discovered internally. That, that, that means that 65, 69% of the time, uh, somebody else informs the company, hey, you've got an advanced persistent threat inside your network. Uh, and the, I think the median time <clears throat> for uh, the bad guys lingering in the network was about 205 days. Uh, so that's a long, a long time for someone to be messing around in your networks uh, stealing your IP, you know, pull, pulling up uh, private information. I'm going to launch the next the next polling question here, and the question is: Is a third party auditing your cybersecurity and IT compliance? Um, you know, as that question is out there, 
um, you know, I, I'd like to continue that conversation on, on you know, the risks and understanding them. Uh, again, we've, we've talked about financial risk, risk with regulators, um, you know, risk with potential uh, reputational risk, um, you know, and as Jamie said, it's hard to identify some of that risk and the total potential of that risk and where it could go if, if you have a lingering threat for 205 days. Um, you know, so, so again, when you, when you look at this, really important that you do take a holistic approach and you understand all of the different types of risks that you're, you're, you're susceptible to. Um, Shire, what, could you speak to some of the regulatory requirements out there and the growing regulatory, um, you know, oversight, uh, you know, as this, as this occurs? Sure. Uh, so uh, traditionally, if you look at the, the past uh, 15 or so years ago, back in the days, even before we used to call it cyber, we used to call it information security, the most regulated industry, financial services, focused a lot on, on uh, major banks that ultimately were responsible for the infrastructure of the financial systems uh, globally. Uh, so there were a lot of... Um, you know, programs that tied into uh, really, uh, you know, assessing and, and mitigating uh, and applying a variety of controls across those types of institutions. Uh, over the past five to seven years, I, I think, you know, that uh, the regulators are shifting their focus, although not, not walking away, but shifting their focus to uh, private equity, broker dealers, hedge funds, uh, sort of mid mid sized uh, type of financial organizations, including SEC alerts, that ultimately is uh, uh, not just uh, expecting these organizations to re react or be able to react to breaches, but they have to have a prepared, uh, they have to have a plan and demonstrate that they're prepared to respond to these types of uh, uh, situations. So. Um, you know, financial services continues to be obviously one of the highly regulated, and then we see a lot of movements in healthcare because of all the incidents that's going on in healthcare, and other industries are catching up. Uh, but also, we see that laws are evolving in terms of, you know, uh, putting some fines and uh, imprisonment of criminals that are caught as cyber uh, cyber criminals. Um, we also see a lot of laws related to data privacy aspects of uh, cyber security uh, which is uh, kicking off from the European Union and leading into the US and the rest of the globe. So yeah, I mean uh, regulations are uh, obviously uh, increasing uh, as this is becoming a critical aspect, aspect of our life given that we're moving more and more towards a digital world and uh, we have to deal with a lot of uh, risk, cyber risk for the rest of our lives due to the fact that we, we are moving into a more open uh, and an endless set of entry points uh, that, call, that is just as much as your uh, organization has to go through financial audit, uh, we are also working with the, the other big eight firms and AICPA to actually put together the uh, cyber security audit. So uh, those are some of the key keynotes. Yeah, we're this. <clears throat> I completely agree, Shar. I mean, we're we're seeing um, two two levels of threat. So there's the threat from the cyber bad guys, whether they're organized crime or state sponsored or or hacktivists or whatever. But we, but there's also the attendant regulatory threat that comes in behind it. And and while uh, the the most highly regulated uh, industry industries such as financial banking, uh, energy. Um, and uh, telecommunications are, are some that you know have, have been grappling with this. Really, every industry is regulated to some some extent. I mean, you don't think of hotels as being highly regulated, but the Federal Ter uh, Federal Trade Commission uh, last year uh, went after uh, Wyndham. And I, to the attorneys in the audience, I would recommend looking at the Federal Trade Commission versus uh, Wyndham. Um, and that was under Section 5 of the FTC Act, which is for deceptive and unfair uh, acts. And, and basically what they said is, well, you know, you were deceptive and unfair in the way that you maintained your customers' um, data. And uh, the, the response that, that Wyndham had to that was, well, wait a second, you can't just do that. We didn't know 
that you could uh, fine us for that, and uh, there's no clear standard. But they came came back, and, and really a lot of the things that the FTC said was were were good hygiene. I mean, you know, make make you know the fact that they stored uh, credit card information in clear text without encrypting it, um, not having a good firewall, not not having a plan to make sure that passwords uh, were changed. Uh, fa they didn't even failure to inventory computers and things like that and and that ended up in you know a 10 million dollar fraud loss and and ultimately a settlement after the third circuit uh you know basically upheld FTC so really everybody to some degree is regulated that's, i mean that's exactly it right i mean what's reasonable and and what's what's that line of neglect um i've had that debate with several uh folks in the in the IT and legal community um and if your neighbor is deploying a a firewall, um, you know that's that's able to protect it, and nine out of your ten neighbors are able to do that, and you're not, and you're you you know you're running off of a, um, you know not to not to insult anyone, but a Best Buy grade uh, firewall, um, you know, in 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 the in the eyes of a regulator or in the eyes of your clients, um, I would say that you're subject to a penalty there. Um, an interesting question just came in. It's uh, from someone who's an attorney that represents a digital marketer, um, and they're drafting agreements between the client and various companies um, to provide their digital services. Um, they're, they're questioning what type of language should they put into their client's agreements. Uh, Jamie, I'll, I'll let you handle that, um, if you don't mind. Just kind of speak to that a little bit, um, you know, what your thoughts are around that. So, so as I understand, the, the, uh, the question is, what should we be putting into our agreements um, to protect from lawsuits from our own clients. Uh, um, no, that... what what the what language should they put into their client agreement um, to protect the client from lawsuits? To protect the client from lawsuits. Well, so um, you know those types of things, um, you know, can be highly dependent on the type of business. But certainly, the way that we have, we have handled that when we do the document reviews, and that's some of the first things that we ask for when we do these type of reviews, is, is to make sure that the um, uh, the requirements for the various standards flow down uh, to the third parties, uh, and to make sure that uh, that they are in fact audited, that they do some of the same things that we just we just ticked off in from the uh, the FTC versus Wyndham case, that they've got the the firewalls. Uh, that they they are actually you know exercising a response plan. We we certainly put in there notification because if you if you have uh, any type of uh, third party contract who has a problem uh, that may affect you, you're going to want to know about it uh, just as soon as possible. And if you're a regulated industry, so much the more so that definitely needs to flow down. Uh, one of the things I would um, suggest that people look at is some of the things that are now flowing down. Uh, from the Department of Defense on there because those those are you know pretty tight but they can give you some kind of guidance on the things that need to be in third party contracts. Thank you, Jamie. So I'm going to pose this next question as as we as we speak to the slide that's on the screen here uh, about the different threats and the vulnerability. Um, and the next question is: Have you been affected by a, um, a ransomware or crypto locker? Um, and you know, the, this question I thought was really relevant to put up here because it shows that the threats and compliance and cybersecurity, you know, as as Jamie and Shyar and myself have said now, are are company wide. It, it has to go down to the contract, um, and you really need to understand every aspect and what it is, um, you know, where where your threats are. Um, so, Shyar, if you could just speak to this that slide that was up there. Um, the different threats and the vulnerability. Um, if you could just walk through, maybe you know, just just quickly again, talk about you know phishing versus um, you know a an insider threat or a state-sponsored threat versus an insider threat. Sure. I mean, uh, as we have seen, um, you know, in the past uh, couple of years, and it's obviously the the type of uh, attacks or. Uh, getting more and more sophisticated, uh, we see that uh, the, the sources of attacks could be at individual levels, it could be at uh, organized crime uh, groups and or state-sponsored type of uh, sources for a for variety of incentives, either competitiveness versus, you know, financial gains versus 
um, looking at you know bringing down the infrastructure of uh, critical infrastructure of a country so there are a variety of uh, reasons behind these types of attacks and um, you know we see a lot of uh, uh, attacks are also tied into the vulnerabilities are tied into uh, a simple phishing attack which we I think majority of us or I will say almost all of us uh, on a regular basis receive these types of uh, attacks where you know an email uh, from an unknown source comes but it looks like you know it's a known source and then the you know the victim downloads the uh, compressed file or clicks on some sort of a link that is attached to that email and that's one of the reasons that one of the most important uh, you know counter attack to this type of uh, uh, you know uh, cyber security attack is is user education and training and awareness because this is all boils down to user centric type of security that needs to be tied into this whole uh, process and once you uh, expose the uh, you know, expose yourself to that particular type of attack, it can spread itself and cascade across the entire network and, and so on and so forth. And, and you know, uh, this slide that is on the screen also shows um, the value of the data that uh, these bad guys are, are getting in the marketplace from social security numbers to um, Facebook accounts with certain characteristics to, as you can see, the medical records are pretty expensive, $50 and up. So those are the things that uh, are really happening in the, in the dark web and, uh, and you know there, there are a variety of uh, variety of organizations that you can also sign up with who can provide you with some analytics around the uh, dark web uh, and a lot of types of attacks are also f in terms of ransomware are tied into like Bitcoin which are very difficult to trace uh, to be able to really and and be able to stop uh, the transaction. So I I promise we're going to stop the fear uh, tactic here. Um, and you know our goal our goal is really to uh, get everyone on on understanding you know where the threats are and the threats are everywhere right. So to summarize, the threats can come internally. The threats come from a contractual um, you know mishap. Uh, the threats come from third party vendors. Uh, the threats come from phishing, viruses. Um, the threats are everywhere. So how do we how do we protect ourselves? Um, and again, self-assessment. Identify your priorities. Um, you know, so really need to understand what your priorities are. Is performance? Is security? Is compliance? Is management of your 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 desktops and of your infrastructure more important? Um, you want to enable mobilization. So really what you want to do is, beyond the self-assessment, you need to prioritize what is important to you. Um, and once you do that, you know, now you can start, you know, biting, you know, eating the elephant one bite at a time. Um, Jamie, what, what would you say is, you know, from your experience, the, the most important thing to start when, when, when you start creating priorities? Where do you, where do you like to start from? Well... <clears throat> Let me reverse that question and say where, where not to start. I mean, this cannot be approached as purely an IT problem. Is if the if the company is looking at it as a, an IT thing and the IT people meet about it and, and and that kind of stuff, then you're actually going to miss it because it really has to be enterprise wide. And one of the I'll tell you one of the areas, and we've had clients with this problem um, where. Uh, their hiring practices didn't screen people, and they had problems with insider threat. Um, and and so, if your HR policies uh, don't include this, if your uh, we've already mentioned the uh, the third party contract suppliers, the supply chain. If you haven't looked at all this, so the first thing is is to make it enterprise uh, and understand that this is as important as anything else that's enterprise wide. I mean, and, and, and from our perspective, on the infrastructure side, we need to understand where your people are. Do you want to enable mobilization? Um, and I'm just going to post, post another question here, is do you have a bring your own device policy here? Um, and this is something that everybody wants. Everybody wants to be able to work from home. They want to be able to work from the road. They want to be able to bring their own device and work safely from, work safely on the 
business IT infrastructure. Um, and the challenge has been and, and currently is, you know, form over function. Do I, do I open myself to additional risk by allowing employees to use their store-bought device versus giving them encrypted laptops that are very expensive? And these are some of the priorities that, that we, before we build a company's infrastructure or we go in and, and make recommendations, is we really want to understand where your priorities are. Um, I'm going to share yeah, this real quick. I, uh, Please, Shara, yeah. yep. Yes, uh, I think as, as it relates to, especially for mid-size uh, organizations, uh, you know, we highly recommend that they take a look at their IT infrastructure and application portfolio and uh, leveraging the, the technologies uh, available today to move into a more of a utility model, uh, pay as you drink kind of a model, lightweight IT because it just doesn't make sense anymore. It's not um, the old days of buying all these boxes of servers and, 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 and thick, la thick layers of uh, computing source resources that you're only using 30% of it and you're wasting all that time and money because at the end of the day, the more you have sitting there, even if it's not fully utilized, then you have to also worry about the security aspects of it, maintainability aspects of it, upgradability. So there's a lot go, that goes with the sort of a internal IT. So I think one of the solutions we, we provide to our clients as part of sort of their uh, security strategies to also take a look at you know, some of the services that we'll be discussing here as it relates to cloud services and kind of moving the risk. Not that you will, uh, you know, you'll always own the risk from a company perspective. You own the risk end to end, but as long as you architect the solution properly and you fully understand from an end to end perspective where the data resides and, and how the process is handled, I think you can do a lot better job in terms of managing it in a much more efficient way. So uh, 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 a very smart um, hacker, white hat hacker that I, that I work with regularly says anyone can build a perfectly secure and airtight environment. Just unplug it from the internet and don't let anyone use it. Um, you know, so it's, it's again, you know, the, we, we at Tetherview, and I think everyone on the call shares this, this perspective, is you want to have a minimalistic approach to your IT environment. Um, the bigger it is, the more complex it is, the more points of vulnerability there are. We really want to minimize the number of doors and windows that we have to protect. And moving to the cloud in the proper fashion allows you to do that. Um, you know, and making sure that company-wide you've got an approach to that. Um, just interesting, you know, numbers that everyone's familiar with. It's 43% of us are using three or more devices. Um, and if you think about that, that's three, if you have a thousand employees, that's 3,000 devices that your IT team has to protect. Um, that's a lot of work, that's a lot of responsibility, and that's a lot of risk. And because IT departments are locking down their infrastructure and making it harder, as security demand grows, um, IT departments are locking down their infrastructure, forcing employees to use consumer technology. Okay, a, a survey from Gartner said 73% of employees are using consumer technology due to a lack of alternatives. What that means is they're using Dropbox, they're using Google Docs, they're emailing to their personal email when they shouldn't be, and just getting around the protection. Um, and what, what we have to realize is if we do not give employees the proper tools, they want to work, and they're going to find ways around your security. And if, if your employees can find ways around, guess what? The bad guys can. Um, again, you know, now we want to just kind of get into the foundation. You know, we've talked about the assessment. We've talked about building a proper um, IT and, 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 and kind of uh, cybersecurity policy. But what are, what are some of the foundational approaches? And for us, the foundation is segregation of data. And this is part of the analysis and, and doing that self-assessment. We want to keep sensitive data out of high traffic areas. We want to make sure that users don't have access to everything, that they only have access to what they need and what they need to know. It's not just from a, um, you know, keep the good guys, keep the good guys honest, right? Keep the honest people honest. But it's, 
it's reducing that point of vulnerability. If you have a thousand employees and 300 of them do not need access to some sensitive data, now you only have to protect 600 users um, from accessing that data and what they do. So there's reduction of risk. And we get back to that approach of what's reasonable, what's expected, what's not negligence. So if, you're, if your neighbors and your peers are doing it, um, I feel that it's important that you're doing it as well. Um, by, by, by the way, Mike, um, on your slide here it says backups. And that, that to a large degree, is the answer to the ransomware question that we had earlier. I mean, uh, don't you feel like uh, you have to have up-to-the-minute uh, backups um, in order to, to preserve your business continuity? Yeah, not, not only do you have to have up-to-the-minute backups, but you have to make sure that the backups are segregated from the production environment. Right. Um, we have seen on several occasions clients who get hit by ransomware um, that we're, we're, we're speaking to, and not only is their, is their production environment hit by the ransomware, but because the backup was kept on the same network, the backup was also encrypted by ransomware. Um, so they were stuck. So the very simple concept of segregation um, you know, is something that we want to make sure that you do. And if, you're, if you have infrastructure on your premise and you're doing it yourself um, with an IT guy who's, who's got wearing multiple hats, and the definition of the IT is you get, IT guys getting broader and broader every day, um, you're, you're exposing yourself to additional risk. Um, Shire, any comment on the segregation of data and you know some best practices approach on, on how to do that? Yeah, one of the uh, applications of what you see on the screen here, uh, in addition to what was said, is uh, uh, you know segregating, uh, segmenting your network uh, as it relates to your critical uh, data. That, uh, as an example, we've uh, recently provided some guidance. Um, hospitals that uh, have been breached or, or or could be potentially breached where they need to segment their network uh, as it relates to ICU or uh, cardiology and the patients, uh, critical patients records as it relates to what's the schedule for surgery uh, and also making sure that not just uh, having a backup uh, so that in the case of a breach, they can uh, basically close the, the network and, 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 and uh, stop any additional uh, infiltration of, of the malware, but also be able to transfer that data. And they, this all have to be tested as part of your incident response plan, by the way. You have to be able to transfer that data, that critical data, to another hospital in case the patients have to be transferred over for a surgery that is scheduled the next day. So these are some of the things that are really in the real world, and 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 we're trying to apply the uh, the you know the the concepts that are laid out in here in the, in the, in the applications that can hopefully minimize the impact. Great. I mean, and and, and again, that that segregation. You're right. It has to be holistic um, between departments, between data sets, and between users. Um, quick question that came in: Is it not safer? Is it safer to back up to the cloud? Um, versus on site, um, it, it, it depends. <laughs> you know, if, if you, you really need to segregate your backups. Uh, we encourage to build private networks that are locked down from the beginning, um, that only allow users in that need to be in. Um, we want to keep the good guys in and the bad guys out. Um, and, you know, backing up to a public cloud has its own risks as well. Um, from a compliance and a and a uh, functionality perspective, um, this is something again. You know, this is a great summary slide from a cybersecurity framework. Um, you know, and and it shows the cyber life cycle here. Um, it, it 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 again. You know, what we've said consistently is it's holistic. It's not just about the IT department. It's not about the IT guy. If you're a small organization that's maintaining your website, your cell phones, your email. Um, your databases and your IT infrastructure. Um, you really need to make sure that everyone up to the board of directors is involved in cybersecurity and response. Um, um, I'm going to move quickly here because we're we're running we're running a little behind. But um, Jamie, could you could you just give us a couple of thoughts here on this on the cybersecurity framework slide here and a governance perspective? 
Sure, and, and brag on my, my partner, Ari Schwartz, who just came with the firm uh, from the White House where he was a senior director and, and did a lot of work on the framework. First, One of the first things I would ask any client walking in the door that says, we got a cyber problem, is, is well, let me see your cybersecurity framework file, how, how far along are you, which it is a maturity thing, and so <clears throat> you, know, you don't have to do everything at once, but it gives you a road map to get there, and governance is so important on this. So we've had uh, a two situations recently where there was a problem we had to go talk to the government about it and and the the regulators were asking well what did the board of directors know what kind of training that they had you know what did the executive uh, suite know, know about and and that kind of stuff so um, you know did they ask the right kind of kind of questions and, and one of those questions was in this particular situation was the the company knew it had a patch that needed to be made but they didn't make it right away, and it would just got to be a low priority. So it has to be all the way up and down the system, and this is a great slide for showing that. Thank you. You know, one of the one of the surprising issues that comes up, and, and people sometimes know or don't know that they, they need to um, um, adhere to it, is data sovereignty. Um, I'm going to ask the question, is data sovereignty an issue for you? And Shire, if you could just define what data sovereignty means to you. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to, uh, you know, one of the first things we talked about, you know, risk profiling, we talked about self-assessment, but uh, at the end of the day, when you look at uh, cyber attacks and cyber security, it boils down to your data and your infrastructure, which uh, critical infrastructure, which impacts the continuity of your business. But as it relates to data, which is really your digital assets, uh, the way we look at the assets, the vulnerabilities associated with maintaining integrity, confidentiality, and availability, as well as obviously the threats that we touched on, we really help, uh, we really advise clients to take a step back and go through the data valuation process to be able to understand the value of their data as it relates to the data life cycle, uh, because as you know, data is not a static, it moves and it ch changes value from maybe being a you know, very restricted, like pre-M&A to very public post-M&A type of. So the valuation of the data directly correlates to how we advise clients to start tagging data when it comes to classifying their data into, you know, restricted confidential versus public. And guess what? By that classification drives a policy associated with degree of control that needs to be applied, as Jamie pointed out, is a maturity model. You don't always have to be Cadillac or, you know, level five. If, it, if three is good enough because you're maximizing your ROI associated with that level of control, that's where you want to go. So that's re really what we I, what we try to advise clients. is not a white brush paint that you just go and try to protect every data that you have, you know, because there might be data that you can afford to live without or if you uh, if you lose, it's not going to have as much of a significant impact to your organization or to your market uh, versus that your core business is dependent on. Thank you. A question just came in, and, and, and a good good segue for this slide is: if infected by ransomware, is crypto locker such as crypto crypto locker? Um, is there a solution other than paying the criminals? The answer is yes, but you have to be prepared for it. Um, it's not something that you are going to solve afterwards. Um, very few people can decrypt those things, if anyone at all, um, in, a, in, a, in a time that, that makes sense from a business world. Um, but the solution is constant backups, constant snapshots, segregating those backups and snapshots and reverting back. Um, Tetherview's solution for our clients is uh, we're replicating data live and we're constantly segregating it amongst different networks. Um, and what that does is it allows clients to say, hey, I can go back 15 minutes, I can go back an hour, and that's a discussion when we do an assessment. Um, so, you know, what we see now, the solutions to the threats are, are, are not about, um, in, in, in our opinion, are not about developing new software and developing new technology. It's about, you know, bricks and mortars approach. Um, and again, that foundation, that segregation, building the right environment, making sure you're patching your firewalls, 
multiple times a day, making sure you're, you're, you're deploying the security patches, making sure you've got a comprehensive incident response plan. Those are the bricks and mortar type of solutions that you need to deploy to protect yourself. Um, these, things, um, these things are rising too. I mean, um, you know, there are some tools out there that can, can decrypt some of these, but uh, you know, the, the, I think it's test script that is the, the one that's rising the fast right now. There's no tool that decrypts that, so uh, you've got to have those solutions that you mentioned, Mike. And, and you know, basic tools like two-factor authentication. It just, again, it's keeping the bad guys out, um, not allowing your data to be everywhere, every place. Um, by by not allowing, you know, virtual desktops have been around for a while, but the technology was not able to work until a couple of years ago effectively. Today, a virtual desktop eliminates data from sitting on all of these desktops, the laptops that run around. Every organization has laptops. Um, every organization has turnover. Um, and by eliminating data on these devices, you're reducing your risk substantially. Um, again, if if Target would have had two-factor authentication on that one server, that hack would not have happened. Two-factor authentication for Tetherview customers is free. Um, we include it for everyone, and we encourage people to use it. You know, once you once you assess your risk, that's when we determine if you should have it. You know, as Shire said, um, you know, it's a maturity cycle. As Jamie said, it's a maturity cycle. We don't want to deploy too much technology that it impedes on productivity. Um, Yep. Shire, I'm, I'm, I'd like you just to quickly, because the question came up multiple times about SSA 16 and other certifications, and what else should people be looking for when they're when they're looking at a provider um, besides SSA 16? Um, what what should they be looking for from a provider to determine if they're if they're deploying a best of breed uh, a solution? Well, I mean, uh, one of the things that obviously the standards that are out there, you know, I think one of the more known and comprehensive standards is the, the NIST framework, uh, the NIST 800-53 that also references COVID-5 and ISO 27001. Those are some of the security related standards that uh, your organization needs to take a look at uh, when it comes to a provider to make sure that they have a, the framework and B, adopted that framework into their uh, practi practices. There are other types of uh, areas that uh, you may want to also consider in addition to what, were, what was uh, laid out on the previous page, which is tied, ties into, you know, the nature of the relationship and the type of transactions that, uh, the, that you're processing. So if you're like, for instance, in the healthcare business, uh, and you have a provider that is core to the uh, back-end process of your healthcare, then you may want to look at high trust as one of the certifications. If you're looking at, you know, a credit card transaction as part of your business process, that somebody's part of the value chain, then you may want to look at the PCI certification. So there are a variety of certifications that are tied into domain and or industry um, and, and function. Uh, but the frameworks are evolving as well because the traditional frameworks, you know, they did not really uh, cover some of the things that we've highlighted on this call, uh, such as incident response and effectiveness of that, or early detection uh, and some of the techniques that is uh, available, as well as some of the government-sponsored type of organizations from information sharing. But a good good set of practices around frameworks is tied into flexibility to various risk profiles that we just talked about, or making sure that the framework covers end-to-end -end coverage. Uh, it provides an actionable set of information that you can take some action against it. And of course, it feeds back into your policies, procedures, and controls that are part of your uh, kind of defense process. Thank you, Shire. Um, you know, and, and, and it, it all comes down to um, that holistic approach. You, you, you have to fit the right solution for the right problem. Um, you know, if you're Chase Manhattan Bank, uh, there's an expectation of you. Chase, I think last year spent, um, JP Morgan spent $500 million on cybersecurity. Um, if you're a small uh, credit union and you have uh, your servers 
on premise in a closet in one of your locations, that's probably not the right approach. Are you going to go out and spend $500 million? No. But there's a happy medium where you're going to mitigate that risk for you and your clients. Um, Jamie, you know, what, what I think is also important is when should the client seek professional, professional intervention? And I'm not talking about sitting on a chair and sitting back, although a lot of us try to treat our, our attorneys as our psychiatrist. I'm sure you've <laughs> been there. Um, but, you know, when, when should they go to the attorney? Um, and, and, and when should they go to the CPA? Well, so we've already, I hope, established that there's, it's a good idea to have some, a third party come in and take a look at, at what you've got. And, and I really do uh, think that that should include a, an attorney uh, review of all the policies, all the contracts, kind of the whole thing. That would be the best idea. But what you don't want to do is to have someone come give you a, an assessment that shows where your strengths and your weaknesses are uh, without that being under attorney-client privilege, because if you do get sued, uh, the first thing that they're going to ask for is, you know, have you had any uh, cyber assessments, do? And then that's that's what your CEO will get uh, questioned on is why he or she didn't do that. So it's it's a good idea to to get that the the cyber assessment done under attorney-client privilege, um, and, and and make sure that you go forward, develop a plan based on that, and move move forward. Look at all the uh, uh, the contracts. Look at the policies. Uh, get get someone like BDO uh, to come in. Get someone like uh, Tetherview to to set up the and do the, the, the proper infrastructure things, <clears throat> and and that you continually do that. You have a cybersecurity instant plan and you exercise it and you train your employees and that you have some type of way some type of metrics to make sure that you're doing. And and, and to your previous point, you know what the costs are. You know, the average uh, cost of a breach of just a thousand records is about fifty thousand dollars. Ten million records is somewhere between two and five million dollars. So, you know, protecting your data, protecting your your system is important. You know, what it's 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 really I think it's really important to once there is a breach too. But if you're doing an assessment, to do under attorney client because um, we have yet, and I'm sure Shyar has the same. We have yet to walk into an assessment. Where we haven't identified major issues, and, and, and we're not just referring to small issues. Um, typically, every assessment we've done, we've walked into some sort of landmine where we, as a vendor, um, sometimes say, "I don't want to put this information in writing because now you're obligated to respond to it." Um, you know, so having it under attorney-client privilege allows you to take the time to talk to your professionals and respond accordingly. Um, and that's the advice. There's a lot of attorneys, obviously, on the phone today that you should be giving your clients. When you get a phone call about a cybersecurity breach, um, you know, ahead of that call, let them retain you. Let's do an assessment. Um, let's make sure it's done under privilege, uh, you know, so that when we do find the landmines, we're not rushing to a solution. We can walk in and with clear heads and solve it quickly. Shire, is there anything you want to add to that professional um, kind of intervention, in, intervention um, you know, topic here? Yeah, just uh, I think we, you you you, hi you highlighted the in the important things. The last thing I want to say is make sure that uh, you know you engage uh, key people in the organization. It's not just your IT, the attorneys, the compliance, the, even the communication and PR. Everybody have to know their role. They must have tested their role against a set of scenarios. So when there is a breach, there's no time for you to start to uh, test the process and and also. If you're hiring like forensics, uh, cyber forensics uh, firms that come in to do that, make sure they've been there, done that before, understand your environment. It's much better for them to come in that know where they're at versus walking in a brand new situation and having to learn the environment. So the last polling question just went up, and it's, it's are you virtu utilizing virtual desktops? Um, and, you know, we feel that it's really important um, to use the right tool for the right right situation. Virtual desktops are not for everyone, um, but we do think that 85% of all users should be using virtual desktops. And the benefit of that is that, it, it again, it minimizes the amount of data that's going out there. Um, one of the things that we like to do is make sure that we are um, having the proper measurement for success. And, you know, for us, 
success is we've built the right environment, we've assessed the risk, um, and we are saving the client money. Um, you know, so it's, it's important to realize that you can have a best of breed solution without blowing the budget. Um, typically, what we want to do is walk in and save the client money, provide them with the tools necessary to develop um, an enterprise grade solution, um, and provide that security and compliance feature. Um, you know, what, what I'd like to do is, Jamie, if you could just summarize you know, some of the key points, um, you know, around cybersecurity policy. And um, then I'd like, you know, just Shire, if you could quickly speak about, you know, what, what a, a, um, an assessment looks like. So, Jamie, if you could, uh, just give us, give us some key points here. Get, get outside uh, look by cyber professionals under attorney-client privilege. Make sure that uh, the company, the firm, uh, has an enterprise view of this and not uh, just that it's an IT problem and that you drive it into every corner of the of the company's business. Yeah, and, sure. uh, yeah, ahead, and with profiling your cyber risk and uh, making sure that your assessment is uh, uh, applicable and, and, and is comprehensive and it's not just addressing different layers of your stack but uh, and then, of course, when you identify vulnerabilities, you can go deeper, applying some sort of a pen testing or vulnerability assessment. But I think that it all starts with profiling your risk and understanding where the focus needs to be. Great. Well, I'd like to thank Shyar and Jamie here. Um, we're, we're gonna we're gonna wrap up. Um, we apologize. We went a couple of minutes minutes over. Um, and you know, we really thank you for for attending the webinar. Um, we've had a great turnout. Uh, we actually maxed out our uh, go-to webinar uh, session here. So if some of your colleagues could not attend uh, because of that, we will uh, provide a rebroadcast um, and we will provide the polling questions live on a one-in-one -one session and allow them to, um, to uh, qualify for the CLE. Um, thanks again, everyone. Um, we, we really appreciate your participation. Um, this is Michael Abood. Um, joined by Jamie Barnett and uh, Shire Shigagi from BDO. Uh, we look forward to you attending another webinar in the near future. Um, please contact us anytime with questions or comments. Thanks again. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Shire. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Shire. Thanks, everybody.